Thing. Order! Oh, order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! London because John Major is speaking. The opportunity to be here today. I must confess when I accepted I hadn't imagined it was going to be quite such a busy week for Brexit but no matter perhaps that's appropriate. Now as you've just heard Brexit matters to the creative industries and the creative industries matter. They express our culture and our values but they give so much more. Nearly 10% of our workforce is in creative industries and they're often young, predominantly young, and overwhelmingly in small units in every part of the United Kingdom. Job growth, as you've heard, outpaces every other part of industry, and especially powerfully in the Midlands and Yorkshire. Their exports total over 35 billion a year. But their added value to our country, both economically and socially, is incalculable and far beyond cash. Our decision to leave the European Union faces the creative industry with a variety of threats that could harm their future, both in financial and in human terms. So I'm delighted to be their guest this afternoon to talk of Brexit. For years, the European debate has been dominated by the fringes of opinion, by strong supporters of Europe or by convinced opponents. But as we approach Brexit, the voice of middle opinion mustn't be overlooked. I am neither a Europhile nor a Eurosceptic. As Prime Minister, I said no to federal integration, no to the Euro currency and no to Schengen, which introduced free movement of people within the European Union, but without proper control of external borders. But I am a realist, and I believe that to risk losing our trade advantage with the colossal market on our doorstep is to inflict economic self-harm on the British people. Of course, the will of the people can't be ignored. But Parliament has a duty also to consider the well-being of the people. No one voted for higher prices and poorer public services, but that's what they may get. The emerging evidence suggests Brexit will hurt most those who have least, and neither Parliament nor government wish to see that. The will of the people so often summed up when sound argument is absent, was supported by 37% of the electorate. 63% voted either in favour of remaining as a member of the European Union or did not vote at all. So there was a majority for Brexit, but there was no overwhelming mandate to ignore the reservations of 16 million voters who believe it will be a harmful change of direction for our country. Brexit. Brexit has been the most divisive issue of my political lifetime. It's divided not only the four nations of the United Kingdom, but regions within those nations. It's divided political parties, political colleagues, families, friends, and the young from the old, as the ballot box showed us very clearly on referendum day. Now we have to heal those divisions. They've been made worse. Worse by the character of the Brexit debate so far, with its intolerance, its bullying and its name calling. I welcome rigorous debate, but there must be respect for differing views honestly held. In this debate, there are no Ramonas, no mutineers, no enemies of the people, just voices setting out what they believe is right for our country. In recent weeks, the idea has gained ground that Brexit won't be too bad, that we'll all get through it, that we're doing better than expected, and that all will be well. Of course we will get through it. Life as we know it won't come to an end. We're too resourceful and talented a nation for that. But our nation is owed a frank assessment of what leaving Europe may mean, both for now and for the future. I fear that we will be weaker and less prosperous as a country and as individuals. And although it grieves me to admit it, our divorce from Europe will diminish our international stature. 
Indeed, I would argue it already has. For decades, we British have supercharged our influence around the world by our closeness to the United States, where policy divisions are broadening, and our membership of the European Union, which we are abandoning. As a result, we are already becoming a lesser actor. No one, lever or remainer, can welcome that. We're all are urged to be patriotic and to get behind Brexit, but it is precisely because I am patriotic that I'm opposed to it. I want my country to be influential, not isolated. I want it committed, not cut off. I want it to be a leading participant, not a bystander. And I want us to be richer, not poorer. Yet every serious international body, including the IMF, the OECD, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, the National Institute for Economic and Social Research, as well as prize-winning Nobel economists, all forecast we will be poorer outside the European Union. Of course, such forecasts could be wrong, but to dismiss them out of hand is reckless in the extreme. Our own government have also assessed our post-Brexit position upon three separate criteria, that we stay in the single market, that we reach a trade deal with Europe, or that we fail to do so. Each option, carefully assessed, shows us to be worse off, and disastrously so, with no trade deal at all. And the poorest regions will be those that are hurt the most. Now, if, as the negotiations proceed, this analysis turns out to be correct, that cannot be brushed aside. I know of no precedent for any government enacting a policy that will make both our country and our people poorer. Once that is apparent, the government must change course. Meanwhile, we're yet again told that all will be well. Certainly, the recent fall in the value of sterling has temporarily boosted our exports. The strength of the world economy may even increase our forecast growth this year. But this sweet spot is artificial. It won't last. Prosperity isn't built on devaluing the currency. More exports on the back of other countries' economic growth is not a secure economic position. The United Kingdom, our country, has been at the very top of European growth over many years. We are now the laggard at the bottom. We have become the slowest of the world's big economies. And that has happened post-referendum, but even before we surrender the familiar advantages of the single market. Our negotiations, so far, have not always been sure-footed. Some agreements have been reached, but in many areas only because the United Kingdom has given ground. Our determination to negotiate the divorce bill and a new trade deal at the same time was going to be, you may recall, the fight of the summer. Instead, it became an immediate British retreat. There was to be a points-based immigration system. There isn't, and there won't be. We were to become then the Singapore of the North. We've retreated now from a policy of lower taxes and deregulation. No transition period was going to be needed, but we've now asked for one, during which we will accept new European Union rules, European court jurisdiction, and free movement of people. Now, I don't remind you of this to be critical. I do so to illustrate that unrealistic aspirations once set out are usually followed by ignominious retreat. And that is a lesson for the negotiations that are still to come. They will be the most complex, the most difficult that any government has faced. Our aims in those negotiations must be realistic. And I am not personally sure that they yet are. We simply cannot move forward 
with leaving the European Union, the single market, the customs union, and the European Court of Justice, whilst at the same time demanding an a la carte, beneficial to Britain, bespoke entrance to the European market. It is simply not a credible negotiating position. A willingness to compromise is essential. If either side, the United Kingdom or the European Union, both sides, either side, if either side is too inflexible, too unbending, too wedded to what they won't do rather than what they could do, then the negotiations will fail. The very essence of negotiation involves both give and take. But there are always red lines that neither side wishes to cross. In successful negotiations, those red lines are traded for concessions. If our red lines are held to be inviolable, the likelihood of no deal or a very poor deal increases. Every single time we close off options prematurely, this encourages the European Union to do the same and that is not in our British interest. A good Brexit for Britain will protect our trade advantages. It will enable us to continue to sell our goods and services without disruption, to import and export food without barriers and without extra cost. It will enable us to staff our hospitals, our universities and our businesses with the skills we need where and when we need them. It will involve being part of the cutting edge of European research in which British brains and British skills can lead the way. And it will mean we continue with the over 40 free trade agreements that cover nearly 60 countries in total that we have with countries only as a result of our membership of the European Union. A bad Brexit for Britain will surrender these and other advantages. For the moment, our self-imposed red lines have boxed the government into a corner. They are so tilted to ultra-Brexit opinion, even the Cabinet cannot agree them. And a majority in both Houses of Parliament oppose them. If maintained in full, it will be impossible to reach a favourable trade agreement. Alarmed, at the negotiations so far, the financial sector, businesses and our academic institutions are pleading for common sense policy to serve the national interest. And fearful they may not get it, are making their own preparations for the future. Japanese car makers, through the Japanese ambassador, warn they could close operations in Britain unless we maintain free access to the European Union. That would be heartbreaking for many people in Sunderland, in Swindon, or in South Wales. And this isn't Project Fear revisited, it is Project Know Your History. Any doubters should consult the former employees of factories now closed in Bridge End, Port Talbot, and Newport, where jobs were lost and families suffered. In 1991, employment by Japanese firms in Wales was about 17,000 people. Today, it is 2,000. If free access to Europe is lost, that scale of impact, if carried across the United Kingdom, could lose 125,000 jobs with Japanese firms. Over many years, the Conservative Party has understood the concerns of business. Not over Brexit, it seems. Across the United Kingdom, businesses are expressing their wish to stay in the single market and the customs union. But no, say the government's red lines. Businesses wish to have the freedom to employ foreign skills. But no, say the government's red lines. Business and academia wish to welcome foreign students to our universities and, as they rise to influence back in their own countries, would then have willing partners in politics and business for decades to come. 
but no, say the government's red lines. This is not only grand folly, it is bad politics. The national interest must always be above the party interest. But my party should beware. It is only fear of Mr. Corbyn and Mr. Macdonnell that prevents a hemorrhage of business support. Without the comprehensive trade deal that the Prime Minister so rightly seeks, we risk economic divorce from the European Union and the chill embrace of a hard Brexit with World Trade Organization rules. Now, leading Brexit supporters tell us there's nothing to fear from losing our special access to the single market. But to me, that seems to be profoundly wrong. Swapping the single market for World Trade Organization rules would mean our exports facing uh, the European Union external tariff as well as hidden non-tariff barriers that could be adjusted to our disadvantage at any moment. One minister has speculated we could face tariffs of 3%, if only. But it's not so. It's much more likely that we will face tariffs on cars of 10%, on food of 14%, on drinks of 20%, and on dairy products of 36%. And even if a successful negotiation were to halve those tariffs, our exports would still be far more expensive to sell. And this would apply way beyond agriculture and the motor industry. And if, in retaliation, the UK were to impose tariffs on imports from our European partners, this would result in higher prices for the British consumer. And if we and the European Union agreed both to impose nil tariffs on one another, as some have speculated, World Trade Organization rules mean we would both, ourselves and Europe, have to offer nil tariffs to all the countries we trade with. That simply isn't going to happen. Now, this is all very complex, but it is crucial, and none of it has yet been properly explained to the British people. There have been attempts to reassure business by claiming that other nations trade with the European Union on purely World Trade Organization terms. That statement is simply wrong. China, the United States and Japan all have side agreements with Europe on standards, on customs cooperation, on mutual recognition and on investment. And these economic giants with their huge economies did so to protect their own European trade, even though none of them is exposed as we are with half our entire exports going to Europe. Ultra Brexit opinion is impatient to be free of European relationships, to become, in their words, a global player, sovereign, in control. I believe they are deceiving themselves and as a result are misleading the British nation. Before the modern world took shape, their ambition would have been credible. But the world has changed. The global market has taken root. And if we are to care for the people of our nation, philosophical fantasies must give way to national self-interest. We cannot prepare for tomorrow by living in the world of yesterday. I don't doubt the convictions of those who long for the seductive embrace of British exceptionalism. But those sentiments are out of date and in today's world simply wrong. Now it's not my purpose to stir controversy, but the truth must be spoken. The ultra-Brexiteers have been mistaken, have been wrong in nearly all they have said or promised so far to the British nation. The promises of more hospitals, more schools, lower taxes, more money for transport were electioneering fantasy during the referendum. The 350 million a week, that notorious figure 
that 350 million a week for the National Health Service was a ridiculous phantom. The reality, the reality is that if our economy weakens, as is forecast, there will not only be less money for the National Health Service, but very probably less money for every single one of our public services. Now, we were told that nobody was threatening our place in the single market. Well, that tune has changed. We were told that a trade deal with the European Union would be easy to get. We could do it in an afternoon. Wrong again. It was never going to be easy, and we are still not sure what outcome will be achieved. We were told memorably that Europe can whistle for their money, and we would not pay a penny in exit costs. Wrong again. Europe didn't even have to purse her lips to whistle before we'd agreed to pay £40 billion to meet legitimate liabilities. Now, I could go on, but I think the point is made. Suffice to say that nearly every one of the Brexit promises is, if I may quote Henry Fielding, and I do now, a very wholesome and comfortable doctrine to which there is but one objection, namely, it is not true. <laughs> now, people should pause and reflect. If the Brexit leaders were wrong in what they so enthusiastically said before, is it not possible that they are wrong in what they now say as well? The Prime Minister is seeking a frictionless border between Northern Ireland and the Republic. She is absolutely right to do so. This is a promise that must be honoured and I wish her well. But so far, it's not materialised, nor, I fear, will it, unless we stay in A or the customs union. Those of us who warned of the risks that Brexit would bring to the still fragile peace process were told at the time that we didn't understand Irish politics. It now seems we understood it better than our critics. We need a policy, urgently, to protect the Good Friday Agreement. And it is our British responsibility to find one. We created the problem, not the European Union. We need to offer a solution and not simply oppose what other people suggest. Now, although the referendum was advisory only, the result gave the government the obligation to negotiate a Brexit. They couldn't avoid it. But they didn't have the obligation to negotiate any Brexit, not at all costs, and certainly not on any terms. The true remit can only be to agree a Brexit that honours the promises made to the British nation during the referendum. But so far, the promises have not been met and probably cannot be met. Many electors now know they were misled. Many more are beginning to realise it. So the electorate has every right to reconsider their decision. Meanwhile, our options become ever narrower. We have ruled out full membership, ruled out the single market and the customs union ruled out joining the European Economic Area, dismissed talk of joining EFTA. A Norway deal won't do, we are told, nor will a Swiss deal, or a Ukraine deal, a Turkey deal, or a South Korean deal. No to all of them, say the government's red lines. So little is left, except cherry-picking, which the European Union rejects, or a comprehensive deal, which will be very hard, if not impossible, to get, so compromises it must be, or no deal at all. It is now widely accepted that no deal would be the worst possible outcome. The compromise must therefore focus around our accepting single market rules, as Norway does, and paying for access, or an enhanced Canada deal. And it would need to be enhanced a very great deal indeed to be attractive. The Canada deal largely concerns goods, whereas the bulk of UK exports 
our services. But what we achieve to protect our interests may depend upon what we are prepared to concede. It is, as I say, in any negotiation, some give and some take. If our red lines dissolve, our options enlarge. Our minimum objective must be that, I quote, deep, special and bespoke trade deal the Prime Minister has talked of. So some unpalatable decisions lie ahead. With the cast iron certainty that the extreme and unbending Brexit lobby will cry betrayal at every compromise. But it is Parliament, not a small minority, that must decide our policy. I spoke earlier of the divisiveness of Brexit across every part of the United Kingdom. But in due time, even the Brexit debate will end. And when it does, we need the highest possible level of public acceptance for the outcome. It is in no one's interest, no one's at all, for the bitterness and the division to linger on. I see only one way to achieve that. It is already agreed that Parliament must pass legislation giving effect to the deal. A meaningful vote has been promised. This must be a decisive vote in which Parliament can accept or reject the final outcome, or send the negotiators back to seek improvements, or order a referendum so the public may approve what has been determined. That is what parliamentary sovereignty really means. But to minimise divisions in our country, and between and within the political parties, I believe the government should take a further very brave and bold decision. I believe they should invite Parliament to accept or reject the final outcome on a free vote. I know the instinct historically of every government is to oppose free votes. But the government should weigh the advantages of having one very carefully. They may find it is in their own interest to do so. There are some very practical reasons in favour of a free vote. Brexit is a unique decision. It will affect the lives of the British nation for generations to come. And if it flops, there will be the most terrible backlash. If Brexit is whipped through Parliament, at a time when the public are so divided about it, voters will know who to blame if they end up poorer and weaker. So both democracy and prudence suggest a free vote. The deep divisions in our nation are more likely to be healed by a Brexit freely approved by Parliament than a Brexit forced through Parliament at the behest of a minority of convinced opponents of Europe. And a free vote would better reflect the reality that for every 17 voters who voted for Brexit, 16 opted to remain within the European Union. But regardless of whether a free vote is offered, parliamentarians must decide the issue on the basis of their own conscience, upon whether, in mature judgment, they really do believe that the outcome of the negotiations is in the best interests of the people they are elected to serve. By 2021, after the likely two-year transition, it will be five years since the 2016 referendum. The electorate will have changed. Some voters will have left us. Many new voters will be enfranchised. Others may have changed their minds. Nobody can truly know what the will of the people may then be. So let Parliament decide or put the issue back to the people. And what is true for the House of Commons must apply to the House of Lords. Peers must ignore any noises off and be guided by their intellect and by their conscience. I have been 
the Conservative all my life. I don't enjoy being out of step with so many of my party. And I take no pleasure at all in speaking out as I have today. But it's as necessary to speak truth to the people as it is to speak truth to power. Leaving Europe is an issue so far reaching, so permanent, so overarching that it will have an impact on all our lives and most especially on the young and their futures. With only 12 months to go, we need answers, not aspirations. This, is, this decision is far more than a party issue. It's about the future of our United Kingdom and everyone who lives in it. That is what matters, and that is why I'm here today. Thank you very much. So John Major there, former Prime Minister at Somerset House, giving a speech on what he makes of the Brexit negotiations at the moment, and he certainly was not pulling any punches. We believe there is going to be uh, some questions put to the former PM. We'll go back to that as soon as we get at some of the highlights of what he was saying there. Um, he said that Brexit's the most divisive issue of his lifetime. It's divided not only the four nations of our UK, but regions within them. And he's also said that government should invite Parliament to accept or reject the final outcome on a free vote rather than a whipped vote. Um, we can listen back in, just see if those questions are going to start in the next couple of seconds. Unsurprisingly, um, here for this incredibly um, powerful speech. And if I may say, Sir John, um, in a week in which this, speak, uh, this speech is being bookended by a speech by the Leader of the Opposition and by the Prime Minister, this one has the merit of great clarity. And, um, <laughs> we're going to throw it open to questions. We have half an hour for questions. Um, I will go first to, as I say, the audience as distinct from uh, media for the moment, but I do want to come to media, when I do come to you, if you could please say who you are, who you represent, please make uh, it a question, not a statement, make it short and make it factual um, as well, uh, because we've got a lot of people to get through and a lot of people want to ask questions. But if I could um, uh, use uh, Chair's prerogative and, and um, <coughs> ask you, Sir John, first of all, you uh, spoke very eloquently about the role of Parliament, parliamentary sovereignty, uh, and calling for a free vote. You also mentioned in the speech that the people have every right to reconsider their decision and one of those options being put to Parliament uh, you proffered was uh, calling for a second referendum. Can I just clarify, on principle, is it your view that at any point between now and the end of uh, either uh, next March or the end of the transition stroke implementation period uh, it would be desirable, come what may, for there to be a second referendum? No, I, I would prefer Parliament to decide the issue. I don't instinctively like referenda. Um, I, uh, I think on immensely complex issues like that, people vote on a whole range of issues. And we are a representative democracy, so my preference would be for Parliament to decide. But if Parliament decides that the divisions are so great, that the way to minimise future division is to put it back to the country for a referendum, then I would fully understand and support that. But I'm not actually advocating it, but I think it is an option that must be open for Parliament to decide. Thank you. Let's go to questions. There's a microphone um, which is here. OK, we're going to keep an um, ear on uh, those questions here, just in case anything yep, spectacularly then, uh, bombastic happens. But let's speak to Tom Rayner, our political correspondent, just for a quick wrap-up of what the former Prime Minister was talking about there, Tom. I mean, that was really, really strong stuff from a former Prime Minister criticising the government that's in power. It's not even someone who's out of office. This is his party and the government. Yeah, it's a significant intervention by Sir John Major. He says that it gives him no pleasure uh, in feeling like he is uh, not in line with those in his party, but he feels that he has a patriotic duty, as he put it, to speak up on this. He says he made a series of recommendations, uh, including that the meaningful vote which MPs will get on any deal that is arrived at between the UK and the EU should be a free vote, which means that parties wouldn't whip their members 
members of Parliament to vote in one way or another. He says it's a matter of conscience. It's a very significant decision for the future of the country. An MP should be able to vote in any way they say fit. And also, he thinks that that vote should be decisive, which means that they should have uh, options to reject it, accept it, perhaps send negotiators back to the table, or put it to a second referendum, put it to a vote to the public. You, you just heard a minute ago he said he wasn't actively backing a second referendum at this point, but does want Parliament to be able to do so if they think it's right. Uh, he also said that he thought that Theresa May's negotiating uh, strategy was flawed. There was one uh, particular quote, Tom, where he said, unrealistic aspirations are usually followed by retreat. That is a lesson for the negotiations to come. He's talking about the red lines of leaving the customs union and the single market, which he shared Say, says shows that the Conservatives are ignoring the uh, concerns of business uh, and that actually, he said, if it wasn't for the fact that many in the business community are concerned about the prospect of a Jeremy Corbyn, John McDonnell uh, government, then actually the Conservative Party, who traditionally have very strong links to the business community, would be hemorrhaging support. OK, Tom, for now, thanks. Like I mentioned, we are going to keep our ears on the Q&A with the former Prime Minister, Sir John Major. I want to make sure that we bring you lots of other news, though, so stay with us more after the break. ...in public, I think it would have a significant impact on public opinion, and I would very much hope that business will find it necessary to do so. Questions? Um, uh, Lady Diana, in the... Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Wait for the microphone, please. And then here, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, Sarah John um, from Best for Britain. We are an anti-Brexit campaign and um, at this point we're, we're unequivocally campaigning to stop Brexit, which we believe can only really be done before uh, the end of March 2019. Um, I want to ask you a question. As one of the architects of peace in Northern Ireland, and looking at the agreement, which is contradictory in many places in the, in the phase one agreement about where the Irish border should be, whether it should be soft or hard or where it, whether it should be between Northern Ireland and, and Ireland and, or in the North Sea somewhere. Um, what is your, your view of, 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 of the, the problems and how, how, whether this is a soluble problem um, and whether if, if we allow a soft border that is putting the integrity of the UK at risk, potentially, as well. There is no more complex problem in all these negotiations than the problem of the Northern Ireland border. And that has been evident from the very outset. The tragedy is that a number of people who should have known better denied there was a problem and offered solutions that were patently not going to succeed the can was continually kicked down the road, and now we find ourselves in a position where we are going to need some form of firm decision uh, very speedily. One decision is clear. Were we to join the customs union, it would need to be a customs union, actually. If we leave Europe, we can't be in the customs union, so it would have to be a customs union agreement. That would certainly uh, solve the problem of not having to have a hard border. There's a huge amount of trade that crosses both north-south and even more east-west um, between Ireland and the United Kingdom. With the north-south border, there are many things that are manufactured in the south, packaged in the north, returned to the south. There's a lot of cross-border activity. Some of it can be dealt with in the way some government ministers have proposed with uh, technology and frictionless trade. But you can't do that when you get to public health. You can't do that when you have animals, I give one example of many, animals crossing the border because they may be carrying infectious diseases, they may have BSE, there may be a hundred different things. They will actually need to be physically examined. So I have spent a lot of time thinking about this. I wish I could find an easy solution. The only solution that I yet know, and there may be others, I concede that, the government may have ideas I haven't thought of, very probably, uh, but the only idea that I have been able to, to come up with that would clearly deal with that problem is to join a customs union. And I know that carries with it for many people disadvantages. But I think the prize of peace across Ireland and the extraordinary improvement in relations between the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom in the last 20 years is a quite significant prize. 
And if I could make just a trading point about it, people ought not to regard Ireland as a nation that doesn't do much trade with us. We actually have more trade with Ireland than we have with South Korea, India, Australia, and New Zealand added together. So it's not an insignificant problem. I know of only the one solution at the moment. My mind is open to others, and I will wait and uh, be fascinated by any further suggestions that may come forward. So the former Prime Minister not holding back there with his views on the government's approach to Brexit negotiations. Uh, let's go to our chief political correspondent, Vicky Young, who's in Westminster. One of the things that a lot of people are already tweeting me about, very angry about, is his suggestion that by 2021 the electorate will have changed, some voters will have left us, i.e. most of them clearly he thinks will be Brexiteers and things will have changed. Well, this was an argument that was made among, uh, by, among others, uh, Nick Clegg, actually, the former Liberal Democrat leader, who said that at the ballot box it was very clear that it was the older generation who were voting for Brexit. Now, if you had uh, people voting from the age of 16, then uh, that would be maybe a different result. But yes, that is a controversial argument, obviously, basically saying that the older generation will inevitably be dying out, and so the nature of the electorate will change. But I think John Major uh, was saying more than that, wasn't he? He wasn't uh, just talking about a second referendum or the possibility of it. He was talking about this place, Parliament, in the end deciding what kind of Brexit uh, we have. He said that the middle opinion was being ignored, that there were uh, extremes on both sides, but people in the middle uh, who uh, voted whichever way were now looking at the economic forecast. He said you cannot have a government implementing a policy that ultimately will make people poorer. So his answer to all of that is to say to Theresa May, be bold, let Parliament decide, let MPs and Lords on a free vote, so that means it doesn't matter what your party whips tell you, what the party managers tell you, that you should be allowed to decide on your, with your conscience which way uh, this should go. And he makes the point that the referendum, although there was a clear result, uh, he says there were still millions and millions of people who voted to remain in the EU. Well, let's uh, discuss this a little bit more. I'm joined by the leading Conservative backbencher, Jacob Rees-Mogg, who, of course, is on the Brexit side of the argument. John Major not pulling his pun punches there. He talks about ultra-Brexit opinion, boxing the government in with its red lines and narrowing the options for the country when it comes to negotiations. What do you well, say to that? He also makes this extraordinary claim uh, that um, uh, the country is being led against its will in, in his speech. I can find the exact quotation uh, if, if you want. He, he's saying um, that the deep divisions in our nation are more likely to be healed by Brexit freely approved by Parliament than a Brexit forced through Parliament at the behest of a minority of convinced opponents of Europe. So he calls 17.4 million people um, a minority of convinced opponents. 17.4 million is a very important number. We had a democratic vote, the decision has been taken, and what he's trying to do is overturn that. That's the whole point of what he's saying. And his speech is riddled with errors. It says things that are tendentious, uh, bordering on the not factually accurate. So I think we need to look at what he's saying and what his motivation is. And I've got another speech of his. I look back at his speech from 1992. Because bear in mind, John Major, for all his protestations, has been a convinced pro-European. So he does say he I obviously said, kept us out of the single currency, for example. I said despite his protestations, but what does he say here? He says we must stay in the exchange rate mechanism uh, because in his judgment, his very bad judgment as it happens, leaving it would be a betrayal of our future at this moment, and I tell you categorically that is not government policy. Within about 10 days we'd left. He also said that he had already achieved far-reaching reform of the common agricultural policy in 1992. So you have to look at the context of John Major's speeches, the fact that he gets it wrong, he's got it wrong in the past, and he's got it wrong again. His broad argument today was particularly about the business world, saying that many of them are saying we have to stay in the customs union or a single market, and the Conservative Party, of all parties, he says, should understand uh, business, and when it comes to our economy, that is the way to keep it strong. That's why I'm going back to this 1992 speech, because that was his argument in 1992. He was saying this is what's in the interests of business. John Major doesn't know what's in the interests of business. He got it wrong then. He followed a policy that destroyed business in the country, ruined families with very high interest rates. He's once again pretending he knows what business wants, and he knows what will make us poorer again. That's what he has been saying.
He also says that what he calls ultra-Brexiteers have been wrong in nearly all that they've said during the referendum campaign. He talks, of course, about the £350 million a week promised to the NHS. He talks about the idea that, we, that the EU would have to whistle for its money. We're handing over £40 billion. The idea that a trade deal could be done in an afternoon. There are still things that people were promised and they may not see that they're coming to fruition. Well, let's look at this. He says Japanese car makers warn that they could close operations in Britain and he says that on the day that Toyota has announced an investment of £465 million in Derbyshire. So for every tendentious statement made by the Leave campaign, worse statements were made by the Remain campaign. And you would expect John Major, a former Prime Minister, to make a statesman-like speech, free of propaganda and cheap comments. But in fact, it's all cheap comments and propaganda. This isn't a statesman-like speech. This is one of somebody grubbing around in the weeds for weak arguments. And it's a very poor speech in that regard. You can go through it, and indeed I have. And if we had time, I'd happily um, construe it paragraph by paragraph to show quite how weak and tendentious it is. What about the idea that in the end, the type of Brexit we have, and you know that this is incredibly contentious, people don't agree about what kind of Brexit we're going for, uh, the Conservative Party isn't agreed on this, the, the country isn't either. The idea that Parliament, this place that you fought for the sovereignty of it, that's why you wanted to leave, partly, the European Union, why not say a free vote for MPs? Did John Major give a free vote on Maastricht? No. I mean, this is where he's really he, guilty. He, of being a complete humbug. But he would argue Brexit has far more ramifications in the longer term than the Maastricht Treaty. No, Maastricht was of fundamental importance. It tied us in to the European superstate. That's what it was about. We were already in the EU. This we is us leaving the, the European EU. Union. But Maastricht is a fundamental change of course of much greater development it brings in foreign affairs home affairs it brings in the social chapter which had not opt-out was then opted into he whipped that through in the most aggressive whipping in modern history and for that prime minister then to say that oh it should be a free vote is either forgetting how he behaved himself ignoring how he behaved himself or his straightforward hypocrisy so how do we now find the compromises that will inevitably have to be made? He is saying that we will have to compromise if we are to keep our economy strong, because at the moment there is no agreement, even within the Cabinet, about what kind of Brexit we have. Well, this is a further problem with his speech, that every time there's a compromise, he says it's a sellout. So we've agreed to give some money to the European Union, and he says that's a sellout by the Brexiteers. So when it's a compromise he wants, it's a compromise. When it's something the Brexiteers have agreed to give in the interests of getting a good relation with the EU, uh, it's some dishonesty on their part. And I think this shows the fundamental flaw in the approach to his speech. And I heard that last bit that was being broadcast before we came on. He also hasn't got his facts right that Turkey is in a customs union, a customs union with the European Union, and that doesn't remove border controls. We had evidence to the exiting the European Union Select Committee just a couple of weeks ago on exactly this point. So I think he should go back, do his homework, and try and make a statesman-like speech, uh, rather than one riddled with errors and humbug. Jacob Rees-Mogg, thank you very much indeed. So some forthright views from Sir John Major and also, of course, as we've just heard there, from Jacob Rees-Mogg too. A standoff between the UK and Brussels seems likely after Theresa May rejected the EU's draft legal text on Brexit, saying no British Prime Minister could ever agree to it. Speaking in the Commons, she said the document, which proposes a common regulatory area between the EU and Northern Ireland, would threaten the makeup of the UK. The draft legal text the Commission have published would, if implemented, undermine the UK common market and threaten constitutional integrity of the UK by creating a customs and regulatory border down the Irish Sea. And no UK Prime Minister could ever agree to it. I will be making it crystal clear to President Juncker and others that we will never do so. Well, in a moment, we'll speak to Sky's Europe correspondent Mark Stone in Brussels. First, let's cross to Westminster and speak to our political correspondent, uh, Tom Rayner. So, Theresa May says, absolutely no way, Tom. Yeah, so what this uh, document is, is the legal uh, spelling out of the agreement that was arrived at in December, where the joint agreement for the UK and EU teams allowed progress to go forward in the Brexit negotiations. And basically what that said was that if a frictionless border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland was not achieved by a free trade arrangement or uh, by technical solutions that have yet to be defined, that there was a backstop commitment uh, to maintaining full regulatory alignment to preserve the frictionless uh, border as it is now. So this is the EU's draft of how that would work in legal uh, 
practice. Now, the issue that is so explosive in all of this, and which Theresa May says means that she could simply not sign up to it, is that the legal solution the EU are proposing is that the that Northern Ireland would effectively remain within the customs union in a sense, erecting a border uh, down the Irish Sea. And Theresa May said that that changes the constitutional integrity of the United Kingdom. It's not something she could uh, accept. It's certainly not something uh, that the DUP, who are, of course, uh, part of her uh, minority government in terms of propping her up in majority in Parliament, uh, they simply will not accept being uh, what they would describe as being cut off from the rest of the United Kingdom. Now, critics of the Prime Minister, from Jeremy Corbyn uh, to to a number of others say, well, this is a result of that red line that Theresa May set out in her Lancaster House speech of leaving the customs union or any form of customs union uh, and the single market. And one of the people who have been, who's been speaking about that most recently in the last hour or so is Sir John Major, the former uh, Conservative Prime Minister, of course. He says that the government has boxed itself in uh, with its red lines and that it, sh it should start to recognise that there may need to be some changes to its position because he says the Brexit that the government is pursuing at this point could potentially make people far worse off, and that could lead to a significant backlash from voters. I believe that to risk losing our trade advantage with the colossal market on our doorstep is to inflict economic self-harm on the British people. Of course, the will of the people can't be ignored, but Parliament has a duty also to consider the well-being of the people. No one voted for higher prices and poorer public services, but that's what they may get. I know of no precedent for any government enacting a policy that will make both our country and our people poorer. Once that is apparent, the government must change course. I fear that we will be weaker and less prosperous as a country and as individuals. And although it grieves me to admit it, our divorce from Europe will diminish our international stature. Indeed, I would argue it already has. It's a pretty extraordinary intervention from John Major. One of the other things that he said is that when MPs have their meaningful vote on whatever deal is finally struck between the UK and the EU, that it should be a decisive vote. And by that, he meant it shouldn't just be a question of uh, accepting or rejecting the deal, but potentially the MPs should be able to uh, ask negotiators to go back to the table or put the deal to the British public in another referendum and he said that that vote that MPs take should be a free vote which means that parties wouldn't instruct MPs to vote along the party line because he said it was a matter of conscience a huge decision that will affect the country for many many decades to come and that MPs should not be uh, pushed into line by their party because it's so important. Tom, thank you. Now, in Brussels, the EU's chief negotiator has urged people to keep calm and stay pragmatic. He said the draft text is a key moment in the process, but reiterated it is still a draft, adding next week will be fully dedicated to talks with the UK. We have applied imagination and creativity to find a specific solution to the unique challenge that Brexit poses for the protection of the Good Friday Agreement. Two issues are key to avoid border checks. First, full alignment with the Union law on goods, veterinary and plant health rules. Second, our Northern Ireland has to be covered by the Union Customs Code. Our approach is focused on those areas where it is needed to avoid border checks. Daily life around the border should continue as today. Let's go live to Brussels and speak to our Europe correspondent, Mark Stone. Uh, Michel Barnier is saying there should be no surprises here. Keep calm, he says, but this is a hugely controversial issue and the one that Theresa May has made it very clear she's not budging on. Uh, yes, and at the heart of it uh, is the Irish border question. Uh, and uh, in a sense, um, Michel Barnier is right when he says no one should be surprised because uh, what the EU side have done is just translated uh, the December deal 
uh, which was part of the withdrawal deal, the divorce deal, into a legal text. Now, in that December deal, explicitly, uh, There one of the options for, for the Irish border that Theresa May signed up to uh, was this idea of alignment between uh, regulations in Northern Ireland and in the Republic of Ireland. In other words, regulations between a part of the UK uh, and the European Union. Uh, she signed up to that then. She said, yeah, it's, it's one of the options. It was hugely controversial. Um, the problem is that the December deal uh, was a fudge. It was a fudge to allow the two sides to say, yep, we've reached sufficient progress. That uh, unlocked the ability to be able to talk about the future relationship, which they are now doing. Uh, and crucially, within that December deal, there were two other options uh, for the Irish border, which would, uh, as Michel Barnier pointed out at the end of his answer there, uh, allow things to remain the same on the, on the island of Ireland. Option one was to have a rich free trade agreement, a bespoke free trade agreement, which would render the Irish border issue, it would dissolve it effectively, it wouldn't be an issue. Uh, and the other one was technological solutions. Now, uh, in the absence of any detail on either of those two options, the EU side says we have to include option three, alignment, uh, as a legal option. And now clearly, Theresa May knew then that it was a political hot potato, it was, it was not something Something she could ever sign up to legally. Now she has come, come close to uh, having to sign that document, um, but she says she won't because she has time, she believes, to be able uh, to negotiate other options, option A or option B, which will mean that option C, uh, the alignment th thing, which is really not uh, something anyone can countenance, uh, it goes away. Uh, it's important to point out this is a draft, so she will be able to negotiate the other options. This draft doesn't have to be signed until October at the latest. Mark, thank you. Uh, I want to ask you uh, about Brexit, uh, Sir Vince Cable. Very busy morning with a speech by uh, Michelle Barnier uh, talking about the draft agreement. Mich uh, Theresa May uh, saying absolutely no way. Where does this leave us? Well, it, it, it leaves us with more clarity that there is a fundamental incompatibility between the position the British government's taken up and the position that the European Union, it's, it's a, you know, an, an immovable object. So, uh, so does that mean we're heading towards force. no deal? Uh, well, if, if um, the British government doesn't change its position, that certainly is the outcome. I mean, the, the obvious way to deal with it, of course, is for Britain to stay within the customs union and the But that's not what market. people voted for, is it? Uh, well, I think some of us would argue that they may well not have been aware of the implications of leaving the customs union. I don't remember the customs union ever been debated in the referendum. And there is a mounting momentum in Parliament, and, uh, you know, we saw changes in the Labour Party at the beginning of this week uh, to suggest that the government may face defeat on that. So it's rigid, hard red lines around the customs union and the single market, I think, are unsustainable un un unless they want to go into a complete collapse of, of the negotiations with all the disasters that would follow it. I don't think the public want that, and I think they are going to have to comp compromise on those fundamentals. Just very finally, uh, before we leave it, uh, Simmons Cable, what do you make of the intervention by uh, Sir John Major in his speech, uh, talking uh, about a free vote in Parliament and possibly a second referendum? I think he's, he will be listened to with great respect. I mean, he is a former prime minister who had a lot of achievements to its credit, not least in relation to paving the way to the, um, the, the, the Irish settlement, the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, he's a very measured, reasonable man. He's not ideological, doctrinaire. He's listened to by people across parties. Uh, and it, it is a very weighty intervention. And his key point is absolutely right, that if the uh, Conservatives try to force their MPs who don't agree with them uh, into line through the whipping system, effectively that re removes the legitimacy uh, for any vote that they subsequently achieve on Europe and that the only right and logical way forward is to leave the public to have a say on the final deal in the form of referendum. This is what the Liberal Democrats have argued for and growing numbers of other people. Sir Vince Cable, thank you. There's also a reaction here too to what the Commission have been saying today, particularly when it comes uh, to Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Let's discuss this a little bit more. I'm joined by the Conservative Chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, uh, Tom Tugendhat. The 
Commission today have come up with something which Theresa May immediately said no British Prime Minister uh, could ever accept. Where does that leave the negotiations? Well, at the moment, the negotiations are really at their very early stages, so I don't think it leaves them anywhere much further than it did before, which is that the Europeans have put uh, some documents on the table, which is exactly what they have the right to do, and the British government is beginning its position to put its documents on the table, and then we'll, we'll have the talks. But the absolutely, uh, m the most essential element of all of this is actually the Good Friday Agreement, not the border. And for all of us who have seen the 20 years of peace and have grown so used to the prosperity uh, and civility in Northern Ireland, any return to the violence of the past would be a terrible tragedy. And, and that means we've got to respect not just uh, the detail of the Good Friday Accord, but of course the spirit of it. And the spirit of it is effectively a triple lock, if you will. It's that there are three groups who must agree should anything change in Northern Ireland. And those three groups are the people of Northern Ireland, both of uh, both sectarian groups, so Catholics and Protestants, uh, the Irish government and the British government. And that's been made very, very clear time and again. And it's only because of that triple lock, if you will, that the Irish government uh, removed its claim over Northern Ireland and that the Catholic community in Northern Ireland began to play its full role, its full and rightful place as citizens uh, in uh, the United Kingdom. And so that's an extremely important settlement and one that we must be very careful not to undermine. One, I must say, hard won, not just by Tony Blair, who quite rightly uh, developed and deepened the peace process, but actually started very much by John Major. Uh, and he has spoken today. I know you didn't hear all of the speech, but if I just tell you, he said that the government was boxed in by ultra-Brexit opinion, and he says that the electorate should have the chance to think again, and there should be a free vote in this place to decide what kind of Brexit we have. Do you agree with him? Well, look, John Major has never had any problems at all finding his own way of expressing things, but as, as I haven't actually heard not even a small amount of his speech, I haven't heard any of his speech, I'm not going to comment on what he may or may not have said, if you'll forgive me. I want to read the whole thing before I uh, give any comment. But John Major was a Prime Minister who managed to lead this country successfully through, as I say, one of the most ex extraordinary moments of peace building that this country has seen, and was able to pass that on intact in a totally bipartisan way to Tony Blair, who then continued the peace building that we see today. And I think for me, the absolute essence of this is that we must make sure that the challenge of identity politics that has been uh, such a curse for Northern Ireland doesn't come back, and that all identities, whether Catholic or Protestant or whatever, are able to have their full expression as British citizens in Northern Ireland, whether they affiliate more strongly to Ireland or whether they affiliate more strongly to the United Kingdom, they should have their civic rights and civic expressions absolutely guaranteed. So that's the essence for me. Just in one word, one of your colleagues has said that what the Commission have put forward today amounts to the annexation of Northern Ireland. Would you agree with that? Well, a lot of people are using uh, many different ways of expressing themselves. I think that's helpful. Uh, people have the freedom to express themselves how they like in our parliament. I mean, that's one of the great liberties of our country, so I'm delighted that they are using that liberty in, in the fullest extent. But the truth is that Northern Ireland has often had different uh, regulatory regimes in certain ways, particularly during the Troubles, of course, uh, during the security measures, and at various points has had different uh, phytosanitary and agricultural standards because of things like foot and mouth. So, you know, there are many ways to look at this, and, and we've just got to make sure that we come to a, a, an agreement with our European friends, and they are our friends, and our Irish friends, um, that works for the people of Northern Ireland, for the people of the United Kingdom, and yes, for the people of the Republic of Ireland too. Okay, Tom Sugarhart, thank you very much indeed. And that point being made by the government here as well, saying that this is the beginning of the process. The document today from Brussels is the beginning, not the end of the negotiation. I've been